Church, if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 22. That's where we're going to be uh, this morning as well. Alexandra Flynn of Fremont, Nebraska, was looking forward to the 2002 homecoming dance. She, she left home with, in high spirits, but she didn't have her school ID with her. And so she, the guy that was at the front door refused to let her in without her ID. And so she had to turn around and go home, which she did. Well, when she got home, she was unable to find her identification. And so her mom went back to the school with her and said, look, my daughter can't find her school ID. She identified her and sort of, you know, tried to explain the situation. But again, she was refused admission into the, uh, into the homecoming dance. She had her tickets in hand, but they still wouldn't let her in. Now, Alexandra was the student body president she played the cello in the All-State Orchestra. She was on a row. She was the cheerleading captain. She spent hours prior to the homecoming event decorating for the dance, but she was still not admitted. Not only that, but she was homecoming queen. And because she didn't have her school ID with her, she was not allowed entrance into the school dance. Now, I know some of you mamas probably wouldn't have you know, wouldn't have responded maybe like her mom did. I, you know, it might be a little hot at that point, and maybe some of us dads too. But when it comes to heaven and eternity and what happens next, I think sometimes we fear the same thing, right? We're afraid that what, you know, after everything that's happened here on earth, that we are going to show up for the party and be denied entrance, Maybe it's because in our mind we're not good enough or we didn't do enough or, you know, whatever it may be. And we still, like some of these things still come up in the church, right? I mean, I, I can't oftentimes, you know, I, there's, you know, I go to a funeral and I hear people say things like, well, if he isn't in heaven or she isn't, you know, I don't have a chance, right? We think, you know, she's the homecoming queen, right? She did so much good. He is, you know, whoever. If they can't get in, well, then I certainly can't. But you know what? According to Scripture, according to the Bible, it's possible to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. You don't have to warn her about showing up at the party and being denied admission because you don't have your ID. Because your identification, it's not a slip of paper. It's not found there. It's actually found in a person. And we're going to talk about that today because the church, even still today, the church struggles sometimes with this our misconception about what salvation is or what salvation isn't, you know, works or the right morals or a certain denomination. We're going to see today that your salvation is actually based, according to Jesus in Matthew 22, on what you wear. Now, that immediately woke some of you up, right? Did he say... That my salvation is dependent upon what I wear. You know, some of you are thinking, I knew I shouldn't have wore this to church today, right? I knew that. I thought he said before that we didn't, there was no dress code there. I didn't, no, no. This, so let me say this in case maybe you think you misunderstand me. We're going to see that when it comes to the renewal of all things, to being with Jesus forever, that you've got to have the right clothes on. We're going to see this. So let's take a look at what Matthew 22 says. And this is a section, well, let's just, let's just read it and then we'll, we'll talk about it. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, right? So we know this, and we've talked about this before. We've seen this as we've gone through Mark, um, that Jesus oftentimes taught in parables. If you grew up in church, you probably went to Sunday school and you know, heard a parable as a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. Well, they're even more simple than that. They're really just parables of truth. They're illustrations of truth. It was really one of Jesus' favorite ways to teach was by telling parables. And while we may have to study a little bit to catch the meaning of what's going on here, for Jesus' early you know, listeners here, they clearly understood what he was talking about. Listen to what he says about the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. 
Now, when I read that initially, or every time I do read it, my heart, my heart, the first thing goes out to this father, right? So here you've got a father who wants to have a celebration for his son. He wants to throw a party for his son. And so he sends out these invitations, but nobody comes. Right? That would break your heart, right? As a father, you want your kids to have friends and to rejoice and celebrate, but nobody wanted to come. But he's not going to let that defeat him, and so he sends out the invitation again. Maybe they didn't get the full message the first time. Verse 4 says, Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. And so this time he sends out the menu, right? He said, look, we're going to have filet mignon, we're going to have T-bone steak, y'all going to, you know, you're going to want to be here for this, right? It's going to be great, I got the grill going, it's going to be hot, it's going to be good, but this time, you know, there's, it, you know, whatever, you're not going to want to miss this. And again, for, as a parent, you know, we may look at this passage and be like, man, I feel sorry for this guy, I feel sorry for the father, I feel sorry for the son that nobody wants to come to this party, but Jesus isn't simply drawing our attention to them. In fact, this parable isn't so much about the one who's extending the invitation as it is as those who are being invited. So surely the lure of great food is going to be enough, right? I mean, if you're having a steak if party, you know, if you're going to have all and you invite me, there's a decent chance I'm coming. But look what happens here in verse 5. They paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. So free food wasn't enough. Why wasn't anyone accepting this invitation? Uh, Maybe it's because of time. Now, we know that wedding feasts back 2,000 years ago in first century antiquity, like this could last. You get invited to a wedding. It's not like you just go to the wedding. You're there for however long it is, and then maybe a reception, and you come home. You're gone for seven days. Like this is an ex- like, and if you accept the invitation, you're going to be go- you're going to be gone for an extended period of time. Now, probably most of us, we don't have a week we can scratch off to go to a wedding, right? I mean, I'm sure that would be fun, but that's going to be difficult. But we're going to see that this isn't time. It's not a time issue. In fact, he's about to get very personal. Verse six it says the rest. Now, when it says the rest, it's those who didn't just ignore the invite. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. Now, at this point, you know, Jesus has got their attention. Like, what? And Jesus always with these parables, he's always grabbing their attention. And most of the time they end like in ways that you can't even imagine. But for folks to snub a king was no small event in this culture. But to kill his servants, you know what that meant? That meant war. Verse 7 says that the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murders and burned the city. Look what happens in verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servant went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And so this time the king is adamant and he sends out the invitation again. This time it was an open invite. Right? This time, you know, the A list is no longer an option. He extends the king. He says to both the good and the bad, right? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But now the wedding hall's filled. And so the party is going to happen now. Uh, well, at least we, we think so. Let's pause here for just a moment. Okay, because this is sort of strange, and it's an odd, you know, Jesus teaches sometimes in these parables, and again, for us, it's kind of odd. Sometimes we're like, what is going on here? They were little, so we got to dig sometimes to see what truth Jesus is conveying, and for us, the point might not be immediately clear, but they're going to understand. His, his hearers in the first century, they're not going to, they're going to understand what Jesus is saying. Listen, when Jesus describes a king and a wedding feast, immediately they're going to know the application. See, in ancient Israel, teachers equated God to a king, and his son represented Israel. And just as God, check this out, just as God invited Israel, right, the chosen one, the Jews, to be his children, what happened? 
Time after time, they ignored him. Time after time, they refused his invitation. Not only did they refuse his invitation, but what? They killed his servants and crucified his son. And the judgment, the consequence was the judgment of God. And Jesus here now, who obviously is God, is able not only to speak to what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. The king would continue to be rejected, and the son would be slain. In fact, the judgment of God really in some ways would come to fruition 40 years later when Jerusalem was burned and the people were scattered. But the good news, check this out, the good news is this reference when he talks about good and bad people. I got, bad, I got good and bad news for you. Which one do you want? Uh, let's just do this, right? The bad people's you, all right? He's talking about you. He's talking about me. Now, not necessarily bad behavior or morals or whatever. He's talking about Gentiles. This is a reference to non-Jews entering into the kingdom of God. You and I are the beneficiaries of the, of the uh, wide invitation that the, that the king sends out here, right? We are the beneficiary when the king sends out another invitation to the party. But the story doesn't end here. And this is the really strange part of this parable that I want you to catch this morning. See, getting invited to the banquet isn't enough. Just getting invited alone isn't. Standing at the doorway and hoping to get in isn't enough. Having your first Christian church identification with you isn't enough. A certain wardrobe is required. you got to have the right clothes on. Look at verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. <laughs> Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without, without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are invited but few are chosen what wait 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 wait. time out jesus right this is is this not the you know this is not what i expected i don't know about you i mean is this not the same king who has been begging people to show up for his son's party and now when this guy shows up and he doesn't have wedding clothes on he kicks him out of the party and to me this is so strange what's the deal here what's going on jesus well it means what I said earlier, that according to Scripture, according to what happens here in the Bible, God cares about what we wear. In fact, the Bible tells us the exact wardrobe that God requires. I'm going to put a couple of Scriptures up. You can go back and look at them later on your own if you want to. You can write them down, whatever it may be. But Romans 13, 14 says this. Rather... Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And so this is Paul writing to, to the church at Rome. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus. And he says this to the church at Galatians three twenty six: You were all baptized into Christ and so you were all clothed with Christ. That means that you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's exactly what we just saw a while ago with their baptism with Jade, right? So now we would say that Jade in Christ Jesus is a children of God through her faith, for she was baptized into Christ and now has been clothed with Jesus, right? And so those are two passages that tell us something that's very, very important. That when it comes to our salvation, God cares about our wardrobe. He cares about our wardrobe. Now, obviously, we're not talking about dresses and jeans and shirts and ties and nothing like that, right? Please know, I've said this before, you already know, there's no dress code here. You don't have to look a certain way to assemble with us. The only, the only thing in Scripture that we have as pertains to dress is modesty. As long as you're good with that, or as long as that's good, we're good. In fact, sometimes it's just the opposite. It's easy to sort of dress up the outside and ignore what's going on the inside. The inside is what counts the most. But God is concerned with your spiritual garments. 
He is concerned. And God offers a garment that He alone can give and is only visible to the eyes of heaven. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, The Lord makes me very happy. All that I am rejoices in my God. He has covered me with clothes of salvation and wrapped me with a coat of goodness. And again, listen, this is so good. Or at least I think it's good. I hope you do too. But I don't mean me good. I mean like all this is good. When we become a follower of Jesus, when we say yes to accepting His love and grace, a wonderful thing happens. That person is placed how? In Christ. They're placed in Christ. Paul, he described himself as a man in Christ. When he described his colleagues, you know how he described them? Fellow workers, how? In Christ Jesus. See, the greatest promise that I have and that you have is not living in this great country, although I'm thankful for it. That's not the greatest hope that we have. The greatest hope I have is not in my own abilities or talent. The greatest hope I have is not even in my family. The greatest hope I have is anticipating the great banquet that the Bible describes is going to take place someday when God renews all things. And that's where our hope's at. And that promise isn't just for preachers or for the rich or for the poor. That promise is extended for all who are in Christ. Amen? I'm not telling you, that's good stuff, right? Paul says it like this in Romans 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In chapter 7, he just is going on and on and on about his struggle and how much he wrestles with sin and how he fails time and time again. And then he says in Romans 8, 1, Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And church, this ought to make you happy. This ought to make you rejoice and be glad. A person who is clothed in Christ has put on the righteousness of Jesus and can now stand before God. Not perfect, but forgiven. Brand new clothes. The righteousness of Christ. And so... Let's look at the other side of this, though. That, that's one side of this. L- l- we've been talking about spiritual garments that we want to be seen in as heaven looks our way. We know what we need to be wearing. Let's talk about what, what not to wear. There, there used to be a television show on. I, it's, I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's not on anymore. There used to be an old show. Some of y'all, I think it was TLC or one of those channels. I don't remember what. But it was called What Not to Wear. Right? Some of you are shaking your head. You remember that, and maybe it's on still. I don't know. But anyway, the premise of the show was built around the fact that somebody needed some help with their wardrobe, right? Their clothes were, you know, they made them either look too old or too young or too sloppy or whatever. And so supposedly a friend would inform the show that, hey, we've got somebody that needs a makeover. And so they would go out and they would surprise them. And so these two hosts would just rummage through their closet. And say, look, you, this is terrible, right? It would make them feel really good and say, you can't wear this anymore. We're going to have to get rid of all this, and we're gonna have to, you're going to have to buy new clothes. So they give them $5,000 to spend. They'd monitor their selections on what they're buying and making sure that they're buying the right stuff, I guess. Um, and honestly, it's a pretty good deal, truth be told. I mean, if anybody wants to sign me up for it, I'll take it. Um, you probably would too, right? I, I know I've got clothes in my closet that are older than half these high school kids in here, but that's beside the point. But let's take a look. Uh, there's a little twist to this show, all right? So let's do Heaven's version of what not to wear. Now, once again, I'm not talking about your physical wardrobe, all right? I'm not concerned about your style whether you're not you're in I probably wouldn't know if you're in style or not I guarantee I wouldn't know probably but let's imagine heaven's version of what not to wear all right Uh, and Max Licato in his book when Christ comes he gives a great illustration of this here's how he drives the this point home listen to what he says he says for just a moment I want you to imagine the most decent honest good-hearted person you know And let's call him Danny Decent. And from our perspective, Danny does everything right. He pays his taxes. He pays his bills. He pays attention to his family. He pays respect to the authorities. He's as good as a person that you will find. But heaven sees him differently. 
God sees what you and I miss, he says. For as he walks through life, he makes mistakes. And every time Dan sins, a stain appears on his clothing. You can't see it, but it's there. For example, he stretched the truth when he spoke to his boss yesterday at work. Stained. The other guys were gossiping about the new employee, and rather than walking away, he chimed in. Stained. A beautiful girl was on television, and instead of turning the channel, he turned his affection toward her. Stained. Now, from our perspective, he says that these really aren't all that big of a deal. But our perspective doesn't matter because God sees Danny with different eyes. God sees a person wrapped in mistakes. And the sobering thing, listen to what Lakato says, the sobering thing about that is that unless something happens, Danny will be the man spoke about in this parable. If he shows up to meet God wearing his own decency and not the goodness of Christ, he'll hear what the man heard in this story. You're not dressed for the wedding. And this is why this is so important for us to understand. We, we, again, we've got so many misconceptions sometimes about eternity and salvation, but Scripture makes it clear it's all about Jesus and who He is and what He has done for us. And the sobering fact is this, church, don't miss this. The sobering fact is this, is that this parable doesn't end with this man going home and learning from his mistakes and living a normal life. Verse 13 sends a chilling statement. It says this, The king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Man, these parables never end the way you think they're going to end. Verse 13 is a reference to hell. See, there's nothing that you and I can do to make our, ourselves right with God. Our best behavior falls short. We can't be clothed in our decency. Our goodness is really an example of what not to wear. Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteous acts are what? They're like filthy rags. Filthy rags. That, that's not good, right? I mean, all right, you talking about my best stuff, Isaiah? My righteous acts? There's times where I'm really good and where I help people and I'm... Da -da. No, they're like filthy rags. If I were to go around this morning and ask each of you, I don't think there's probably a single person in here if I said, hey, we got anybody in here that hasn't sinned, right? We got any perfect people i don't think there would be anybody in here say yeah i've lived a sinless life preacher up to this point if you have please let me know and we can uh, we'll swap places right i'll sit down right away and you can come up and do your do your thing but because god is just yeah, listen we all we're all sinners right we've established as paul establishes in romans 3 23 he said we've all sinned and fallen short of god's standard god's uh you know god's mark we've missed the mark that's what sin is but because of that God is just, sin has to be punished, right? But here's the good news. God provides a way to avert the punishment that we deserve onto Christ, but we've got to be in Him. We have to be clothed in His righteousness. Our decency isn't enough. We've got stains, right? And they all need washing. Here's what Lakato says again. He says it like this. He says, so let's imagine that Danny understands what God's done for him and his need to be seen in a different wardrobe. He decides to make Christ his Lord and is baptized in him. What happens? Well, in an act visible only to the eyes of heaven, God removes the robe of stains and replaces it with his robe of righteousness. As a result, Danny is dressed for the wedding. See, your clothes really do matter. You didn't think I, you thought I was crazy maybe when I said that your clothes really do matter. Listen to how Jesus describes the inhabitants of heaven. Revelation 3, they will walk with me and wear white clothes because they are worthy. Those who win the victory will be dressed in white clothes like them and, and I will not erase their names from the book of life, but I will say they belong to me before my father and before his angels. Listen to the description of the elders 
surrounding the throne were the 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. What about the angels in heaven? How are they dressed? Well, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on a white on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, all dressed in white, a symbol of purity and holiness, all in good standing with a holy God, the saints, the elders, the armies. How do you suppose Jesus is dressed? Well, we think in white, right? I mean, of all the people who are worthy to wear a spotless robe, Jesus is. But according to the Bible, He isn't. He doesn't. Listen how Revelation 19 describes Him. Then I saw heaven open, and there was before me a a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice He judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. I mean, why is everybody else's robe in heaven other than Jesus's white? Why is his cloak not spotless why are his garments dipped in blood and the reason is is because paul makes it clear to us in galatians and all throughout the new testament is that christ traded places with us this is what jesus has done for us on the cross the most simple way to the simplest way to explain is that he traded places with us Lakato again says he did more than remove our coat he put on our coat And he wore our coat of sin to the cross. And as he died, his blood flowed over our sins. Do you understand? Church, do you understand that this is the gospel message? This is good news for not only you, but for all creation. For your neighbors, my neighbors, and for all alike. Do you understand what Jesus has done for you? Do you understand why it's so important that you place your faith in Him for the rest of your life, not just for eternity and what's going to happen, but for now, and allowing Him just to change you and do an incredible work in you? Back in 1999, a golfer, uh, Tiger Woods, he, he signed at that time a five-year contract extension with Nike for about $100 million. At the time, it was the richest endorsement deal in sports history. I'm sure it's much more than that now. He, but he, was, he signed with Nike. He was able to actually keep his endorsements through a, a lot of stuff that he went through a few years back. But when you watch Tiger Woods play golf, you know that he's clothed in nothing but Nike gear. A Sports Illustrated article back then described him in this way. It said, in advertising jargon, Woods is head to toe a Nike man. He wears Nike footwear, clothing, gloves, and hats. My question to you this morning is, what are you clothed in? What are you clothed in? What are you wearing from head to toe? Are you counting on your own decency for your own salvation or for your salvation? Or are you hoping to do enough like you know that God would somehow let you to the party or have you totally surrendered your life to Christ and you're wearing his his righteousness you know in 1830 George Wilson was caught robbing the mail and in an attempt to escape he shot and killed a government employee and Wilson was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged but for some reason president At the time, Andrew Jackson offered Wilson a pardon. But to the astonishment of everyone, George Wilson refused it. Prison officials, they didn't know what to do with this. This was unheard of. In fact, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, where uh, where Chief Justice Marshall made this decision. He said, a pardon is a slip of paper. The value by which the acceptance uh, or is determined by the acceptance on the part of the person being pardoned. If it's refused, 
It's not a pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And he was. See, Christ has given you a pardon. But you've got to accept it. Right? God wants to give you a brand new set of clothes. But you've got to want them. He wants to exchange your old clothes that are stained with sin and guilt and mess and give you a brand new set of clothes this morning. The invitation to the wedding feast of the Lamb has been extended to you personally. But just like the folks in Jesus' parable, you've got to decide whether or not you want to come. You want to refuse his invitation? You want to continue to scoff? You want to continue to say, nope, I'm not interested in that party. I'm not interested in changing my life right now. Jesus, i got too much going on. I, I, because here's the thing. One day, you're going to draw your final breath. You better make sure you get the right clothes on. You're standing before your creator. I want you to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. So what's your next step? What's your next step? For some of you today, your next step is baptism. For some of you today, your next step is the same as we saw just a little bit earlier. You've perhaps you've you know decided that you want to follow Jesus. Maybe that's something that you've decided a while back, but you've but you've put off this decision for whatever reason, or maybe just never you know heard it. It was important, whatever. So for some of you, that's your next step to be baptized. For some of you today, maybe it's a decision to, to rededicate your life. Like, that's your next step. You're like, you know what? I've been, I've been ignoring the Holy Spirit so much in my life. I've constantly heard God telling me what He needs me to do, but I continue to reject. Just like these folks who are rejecting in the parable. So for you today, maybe your next, even right where you're at, is to rededicate your life. Or for some of you today, I mean, the, the next step for you is to take this message out. And beyond these, these walls. Because we've got good news. But it's only good news because we know, we know the rest of the story. right? We, we know that sin, God is, is just and that sin is going to be punished. But Jesus has died for us. And so we want to help people know to get prepared. That they don't show up for the wedding feast someday and not have the right clothes on. So what's your, your next step? I don't know what it is, but be happy to talk to you uh, about it. Let's be standing, and I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to sing a song, and maybe just today for your next step, it's just to worship God and just to give Him praise and glory in, in all things. Let's pray. Lord, we, we just come to you just now. and God, I thank you that, uh, Lord, thank you for Jesus. God, thank you that He has shed His blood and has went to the cross on my behalf. And Father, he's taken what I deserve. Lord, I just pray if there's any here today who've trying to been getting through life by their own decency or their own righteous acts, Father, that today they'll put that behind them and they'll trust you. Lord, whatever our, the next step is, I pray that you'll give us the courage to take it all. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.